first, I would like to tell you a little bit about how this idea came to be. Um, Alejandro and myself have been working on this workshop called Deconstructing the Establishment of Masculinities and Intersectional uh, Experience. And um, we thought about this from the acute link between the patriarchy, militarism, and gender-based violence that um, has constructed over several decades in Colombia a specific model of masculinity, which not only normalizes um, multiple types of violence against children, youths, and adults, but also hinders the emergence and implementation of practices and public policies aimed at guaranteeing gender equity and allowing the construction of diverse masculinities. This model of hegemonic masculinity has expanded culturally and institutionally in such a way that the measures installed in public policy through national regulations or international agreements in recent years are very few. And they do not have um, sufficient resources nor are they disseminated and in effect, they lack concrete implementation possibilities. So this workshop is, um, the idea is to allow participants to share their experiences and perspectives from an intersectional standpoint, from your own um, context. And we have some guiding questions that we are going to share with you uh, shortly. Um, and we also have um, the, so the activity today is not only an answering these guiding questions, but also um, constructing collectively uh, an infographic. That's the idea. So we have um, this methodology to collect the information and the experiences that you want to share in this space. And then we will um, turn that into an infographic. So here in the screen, Alejandro is going to explain to you what the activity is going to look like. Eh, hola, buenos días. Mm, bueno, eh, La idea sería entonces, eh, pues tenemos presente que aquí vamos a hacer un ejercicio comparativo entre dos países. Estábamos esperando a ver si se conectaba alguien de, de Chile, pero al parecer tuvo como unos problemas, nos estaba escribiendo, por eso habíamos planteado un primer ejercicio en el que se tenía contemplado también ese mapa. <coughs> Pero bueno, vamos a hacerlo por ahora con dos países que van a ser eh, Colombia y Camerún. Eh, uh, yo voy a poner en el chat de la, de la llamada de esta sesión eh, este link que tenemos para eh, compartir eh, para el desarrollo de la sesión. Y con ese link eh, se puede acceder a esta pantalla en donde pues vamos a tener esta opción de ir ubicando eh, sobre estos, estos mapas. Nosotros vamos a sugerir como algunos elementos que tienen que ver un poco con prácticas institucionales y culturales que van eh, militarizando las masculinidades en Colombia pero eh, pues a la vez mientras lo vamos haciendo acá en Colombia, la idea es que otras personas puedan ir haciendo o puedan ir poniendo la misma información sobre el mapa de Camerún, que es este que está aquí al lado, que parece Latinoamérica al revés, pero pues son los, digamos, como vamos a proponer ese como un ejercicio de análisis comparativo, para mirar entre distintos contextos, si hay eh, prácticas o disposiciones similares que funcionan a nivel cultural y a nivel institucional en la militarización de, 
de pues, las sociedades, pero concretamente de las masculinidades, tanto en la infancia, como en la adolescencia, como en la adultez. Um, si sí, sí, pues las personas que, que están de, de Camerún o personas como que quisieran contribuir también desde, desde otros eh, países, pues vamos a tener esta, dentro de esta eh, interfaz, tenemos esta opción de usar acá eh, estas notas adhesivas y aquí se pueden ir poniendo como algunas notas, ¿no? Entonces, por ejemplo, en Colombia tenemos... Eh, como prácticas institucionales y se puede poner acá el servicio militar obligatorio una vez tenemos esto se crea la la nota y esa nota se puede ir dejando acá como eh, a este lado del mapa lo mismo podría funcionar eh, pues para el lado de eh, Camerún. Estoy viendo acá en el chat. Mm. A ver. Eh, si, por ejemplo, eh, hay alguien que pues, es de otro país, podríamos mirar como a colores, como proponer por el, por el chat como algunos colores. Supongamos que hay alguien acá presente de Estados Unidos, ¿no? Entonces dice, bueno, yo lo voy a hacer en este color. Y eh, en Estados Unidos, eh, como práctica institucional, eh, se puede poner esta práctica de mm, no child, left behind, que yo no sé si se mantiene. Y eso lo podríamos, tenemos la posibilidad de establecer una nueva diapositiva. O lo podríamos poner, digamos, como eh, aquí mismo, como sea, pues igual esta plataforma permite que eh, vayamos trabajando sobre nuevas diapositivas que se pueden ir creando sin problema. Es, esa es la, la propuesta que tenemos para eh, la propuesta que tenemos para el, el, el ejercicio que pues, haríamos para arrancar. Aunque nos gustaría, obviamente, primero, pues, como antes de, de ir haciendo esto, pues, poder presentarnos para saber quiénes estamos, de qué países estamos, y luego arrancar con esta metodología. Solo queríamos explicar eh, el por qué les compartimos el link de esta plataforma y eh, cómo funcionaría la metodología. I'm going to um, do this part in, in English. So we can introduce ourselves and, um, you know, our names, where, where are we from, and um, what part of this session most interests us. So I'll begin. Uh, my name is Veronica. I'm from Colombia, and I work in Wilf Colombia, or Limpal. Um, I'm a researcher and um, I've been working on the Militarized Masculinities Project with the other sections. So um, who else wants to introduce themselves? I see we have people from uh, Cameroon and Uganda. Do you want to introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Stella from Uganda. I'm a peace and security expert, especially looking at gender roles. Thanks for inviting us. Welcome, Stella. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Guy Fugat from Wilf in Cameroon. I'm the director of programs. And I also work as part of the, this project in Cameroon as part of 
analyzing the, the causes of masculinities in, in the Cameroon context. So, thank you. Thank you, Guy. Welcome. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Alejandro. Uh, um, I am a teacher and a social researcher, and I'm working with a conscientious objectors organization and DIPAL in this project of uh, confronting uh, the militarization of masculinities. So here we are. Okay, thank you everyone for your introduction. I'm going to explain the methodology that Alejandro was talking about in English so we can have both, because I know at that time um, the translation wasn't working. So we're going to do it again. So um, here in the screen, you can see two maps, Colombia and Cameroon. And the idea is to have uh, in each map information about how um, masculinities are militarized culturally and institutionally. We are going to be talking mostly about those two factors. So for that, we have these post-its that um, we can write on, we can change the color as well. So we can have one color for cultural factors, one color for uh, institutional factors, um, or however we decide to use the colors. And we're going to write in the post-its and each um, post-it that uh, Alejandro is showing the example, an institutional factor, and we uh, write something about our countries. Um, for example, here in Colombia, we have mandatory military service. So that would be an institutional factor that militarizes masculinities. And then we are going to uh, place that posted in the uh, Colombian map or on that side. So once we are done with this session, we'll have each um, country with uh, their own uh, information about how masculinities are militarized there in that context. Now, we know that there's also um, Stella, who's from Uganda, so we're going to have another uh, slide for her and where we can have the post-its for Uganda's um, uh, context. We, I also see that there's uh, Oscar Santiago, uh, but I'm not sure he, uh, if you want to introduce yourself so we can know where you're from. Um, so that's the methodology for this, this activity. And once we have all that information, we're going to um, collect it to uh, build a collective inf in infographic that we're going to share with you once we have it. And that would be the, uh, the product that comes from, from this session. So, uh, are there any questions um, about how this works? Can everyone access the link that Alejandro sent in the in the chat box? And um, Oscar Santiago, if you can uh, introduce yourself um, so we can know where you're from, that would be great too. So we can also write it uh, together once we're here in, um, I mean, the shared screen so we can see what we're going to write and we can also discuss it. So I think we should begin. I see that Stella is no longer here in the session. So I think we can begin with with the first um, with the first post-its. So Alejandro wrote for Colombia that an institutional factor is the mandatory military service for one year uh, for men. So for example, Guy, what would you say is uh, an institutional factor of the militarization of masculinities in Cameroon? Did you give me the floor? Yes, yes, I did. I was asking you about uh, what do you think is an institutional factor that militarizes masculinities um, in Cameroon? 
Okay, thank you. Because the internet is not very good here sometimes. It is good when I'm trying to listen. But if you want to mention some institutional factors of militarized masculinity, we also have the, I can first mention the, the, the army as a institution. The, there are several uh, ministries in charge of uh, security and defense issues, which are, we have missions to use uh, force, to use uh, arms when it comes to, to solve problems. So th this is uh, the first factor I can mention. Uh, maybe it's not specific to, to Cameroon, but I can say that the, the army normally has a, a mission to educate, to keep the order. But the way it is in Cameroon, the mission uh, to, to use force, to use force, yes. It's like institutionalized, that's what I'm putting this way. Uh, thank you, Guy. That's very interesting. I think we can um, draw a lot of comparisons with with the situation in Colombia as well. Um, so we were also talking about how there are cultural factors that can influence how masculinities are constructed and how they are militarized. Um, so, Um, so we we thought that we could do like examples of how in our countries there are cultural aspects or cultural um, activities that can uh, lead to this kind of masculinities. So um, Alejandro is writing in the cultural factor example that um, every July the 20th we celebrate a military, military parade uh, for the Independence Day of, um, of our country. So this is a big celebration that takes place um, in Colombia that uh, there's, you know, everyone showing or uh, showing up to see uh, the military um, parading down the street and showing their um, their weapons and their, um, all of their military, um, tools that they, that they acquired. So this is a very cultural thing because we have this, this idea that, um, the military is kind of the savior of our nation that is always protecting us from, um, enemies that live inside our nation as well. So this is a very cultural way of sending a message that masculinity should look like this, should look like what a soldier looks like walking down the street with his weapons. Mm, so we thought that that also influences how um, children and adolescents have this idea of what masculinity should be and what it should look like and what they should aspire to be when they grow up. Um, other, other cultural factors like this in your own context that you can share with us that has um, an impact of how, on how masculinities are constructed? Yes, if uh, talking of cultural factors, there are some traditions there are some traditions in, in Cameroon that have constructed some gender norms. Yeah, that have, there are gender norms constructed uh, based on the cultural, uh, the traditional uh, aspects. Basically, I, I would say it simply. So there are co constructed norms based on the traditions 
that based on the tradition, that make uh, men behave in any time like they are the only one who exists. Yes. For example, there is a, during uh, funeral ceremonies in the West region, for example, they used to shoot guns. They used to shoot guns and only men are allowed to, to do that. And this make them feel uh, stronger than everybody because no, they do something that no one else can do. And it is, it is known as a part of the tradition. Thank you so much, Guy, for that, um, for sharing that. So what we're trying to look for here is the, are the common patterns that exist in the construction of masculinities in militarized countries and militarized societies. And I think that once we, uh, now that we are beginning to share our own experiences from our context, we can see that there are a lot of um, similarities between how um, the military, what role the military plays in our society. Um, there's also this, this idea of how, for example, I think this is a cultural factor that can um, affect a lot of countries, not only uh, militarized ones like ours, but also other countries, because this is a mass media um, propaganda where we have um, video games and we have um, movies that sort of not only are based on war, but also um, have this clear idea of what a hero looks like and what a hero should do. And this movies, this um, uh, TV shows, this video games travel all around the globe because of globalization and they settle into our uh, collective minds, into our collective society uh, of how, of what we are supposed to be celebrating in our culture. These types of like, um, I don't know, Marvel movies that are so huge everywhere are a huge example of this as well. And it's interesting to see how this, um, this mass media war propaganda doesn't always only affect militarized uh, societies, but also every single one, because we have this idea, this uh, globalized idea of what um, masculinity should look like. So do, would you agree with that? Also, we have Oscar Santiago de Mexico. Bienvenido, Oscar. ¿Te está sirviendo bien la traducción? Eh, bueno, veo que tienes fallas en la traducción. También, eh, si quieres compartirnos algo de lo que estamos hablando sobre los factores culturales e institucionales, lo puedes hacer en español sin ningún problema. Uh, so this cultural factor that I was talking about is one that um, is the link between our uh, our like uh, particular experiences of how masculinities are militarized, but also very uh, specific things like uh, what Guy was talking about, like the traditional aspects can also be seen in our cultures. We can do a lot another uh, cultural factor to see how how this works. Alejo, no sé si quieras um, decir algo frente a eso. Yeah, I, I want to ask uh, about this practice uh, of uh, costumes, military costumes uh, uh, for child. I don't know if in other countries it's is a common thing also but here we have uh, in halloween or in a military parade we always seen a lot of childs with the uh, costumes of 
soldiers or uh, with toy guns and all these things. So we have this this question of if, if, if in other countries uh, have the same practice. You do uh, ask a question for me because I, I didn't hear. Uh, we were asking in general um, for everyone if it's uh, common in your uh, in your context to see children who want to dress up as um, soldiers or policemen and use toy guns. Is that a common um, thing that you see in your context? Yes, uh, this is what happened. And uh, I will go through a small history before uh, coming to the, the most recent fact about this. So in the history, uh, during the, the end of year uh, ceremonies, like uh, the Christmas, the New Year celebration, it is, a, as it is, it is known that uh, parents should buy toys for their children. And in the minds, including for, for parents, they, 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 have, they were used to, to, to buy war uh, toys for boys and, and the order for the, for the girls. But war toys like uh, planes, like uh, guns, yes, including like, men with mil uh, wearing military uniforms. And these were usually done for, for boys, for them to, to strengthen their power. Because in the education of, of boys, they are taught that a man should be strong. And considering this, they add anything possible that make them feel strong, that may make them get the, the power. And considering this in how uh, it was having impact on, on, on their behavior, there were organizations that conducted campaigns, campaigns to sensitize against the, to say, on the use of those toys that are dangerous for, for the boys. And it happened that uh, the national level, they, they, had, they prohibited the exportation, no, I mean the importation of those uh, toys become the, because they usually come from abroad. They are not manufactured in, in Cameroon. And since like uh, three or four years, these toys do not enter too much in the country. But there are some few that we can still see. And in the families, they are aware that they should buy toys that help to educate, like books, that they should buy things like a, a computer that can educate. But the recent history I wanted to tell is that because of the conflict that have uh, that are going in Cameroon since uh, five or six years. We had to meet children uh, about uh, a month ago in the, when we were having an interview with some traditional, a traditional leader that hosted many IGPs in, who, who ran their village because of the conflict. And he created a school for those uh, children, IGPs. And when we talk to, to them, most of them say when they will grow, they would like to be military. They would like to be soldiers because the soldiers are very strong persons. And when they want to play, they want, when they want to play, what comes in their minds is like uh, simulating war. This is what the, the, the games they are used to do. And they will just use their, 
your fingers like uh, like a gun and the mouth like being shooting, the sound of shootings. This is how they will be playing every time. And they know very well what is the gun. They can describe what is the gun, what the gun is used for. They know everything and they talk about it without uh, so much fear, you see? And some of them, of course, some of them are traumatized when we talk of uh, military because they have seen how the war in the, in the war military and the other armed group were fighting and killing people. And it happened that in their school, when a, a, a policeman or someone come in, to, in the school wearing the uniform, most of them will just run away because they are afraid of that uniform because they remember what they witnessed concerning this, uh, this, this person, these militaries. So uh, this is how children live now. They, 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 there are a mix of feelings. Some do fear a lot when we, we mention police, military, but the others feel like uh, they, they should be military to, to keep force, to, to, keep, uh, to keep peace because they think uh, they, we keep peace by killing those who are arm group, for example, yeah. That's very interesting. So there's like uh, this very ambiguous feeling about the military where they are scared of them, but also have a lot of respect for their role in the society. I mean, the children, that's very interesting. Um, I think something similar happens here in Colombia where um, they have this, um, like they want to be like the soldiers, but they also know what the soldiers can, can do to their communities, to their families, to the territory. So that's very interesting to see that, that link between these, these two um, contexts. Is the military service mandatory in Cameroon? It is mandatory for some uh, positions, not for everybody. When you want, those who are trained to be uh, administrators, yeah, there is there is a school of administration. Yes, where they train the administrators, the even the magistrates. Yes, the military service is mandatory for them. And it's only for men, mandatory. No, both men and women. All those who attend the school okay. do the service. For very specific uh, positions. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so Alejandro was writing that this is something that happens in Colombia. There are a lot of great benefits for those who belong to military forces for their families as well. So that's a, a huge incentive for them to join the military. Um, does that also happen in, in Mexico or Cameroon? Yes, I, Veronica? Uh, yes, Guy? Yes, I'm seeing the question uh, Alejandro's question in the chat. ¿Qué tal son los salarios de quienes entran en las fuerzas militares o la policía en México? I can also answer that uh, concerning Cameroon. Yes, because uh, those who are in the, in the military, their salaries are normal salary for civil servants, but they have specific uh, advantages uh, regarding their position as uh, military. For example, they will have, uh, they will be paid for wearing the uniform. They will be paid for wearing the, the arms. There's no two things they, they are paid for that. So th those are some specific advantages that they have. 
for being military. Sorry, can you repeat what the uh, what one of the advantages was, please? Yes, yeah, they have uh, advantages. They are paid for wearing the uniform. Mm. Yes, and they also paid, yes, they also they also paid for wearing the the guns. Okay. Yes. So that's also something that we that our countries have in common as well as. In Mexico, there are a lot of benefits for the military and the um, to join the military in general and their families as well. And uh, I'm, I'm putting in the middle the the ones that are uh, common factors, common uh, similar practices. Uh, no, not only institutional or cultural. If, if, if you uh, want to talk about another kind of or practice uh, about a militarization of masculinity, please just do that. Uh, we can share another very specific experience of Colombia, um, the military circuses. So Basically, um, the military does this tours uh, through various uh, towns where they set up a, cir a, a circus and they invite children. And um, this is also a way to, to, it's kind of a way to recruit children in a way. It sends a message that they, um, that when they grow up, they can be this. Um, so this is a very specific thing that happens here in Colombia uh, that is very explicitly uh, trying to militarize um, our lives, but also the minds of children and how they, they think about masculinities, how they think about what their role in their families, in their communities, in their societies should be. Um, are there any very specific examples that you can share from your countries like this one? And we have a question also. And in Colombia, we have this idea that uh, the uniform makes uh, men more mandri and attractive for women. I don't know if the same idea uh, has some presence in Cameroon or Mexico. What do you say? Alejandro, please, I did not get very well the question. Yeah, the question is, is uh, if in Cameroon, the they have also this idea that the uniform make men more attractive, more appeal to women? Uh, yes, this is the a fact. And we, we notice that when, in, I will say that in Cameroon, when you, uh, you are getting in the, in the military, you are getting in the military, they, they will prohibit but the law prohibits a military to to get married before a certain age, uh, and they should not even have uh, children before the certain age. I can't know what the exact age, but so this is why this is because uh, military men when they have the uniform they feel like uh, the more powerful, the more beautiful, uh, the more handsome people. And when the law prohibits them to get married, uh, get and have children at certain age, this is because uh, they want to limit this. Uh, it is a way, I mean, as, as I imagine that it is the way to limit these uh, attractions towards uh, uh, women, I can say it like that. Yeah. 
Um, so we see that, that this is also a link between the three contexts where um, the military represents something that is very attractive, something that is very um, desirable. Um, so this is, uh, it's interesting because one of, uh, one of the things that we see here is that um, there are, there is this idea of like a uniform can make you more attractive, but there is also a lot of um, violence in um, couples that are composed by a military uh, a soldier and uh, a woman. So it's a, um, a very strange thing when this happens because there is this, um, it's very contradictory to what um, the uniform is supposed to represent and what, um, what it represents to the, um, to the desire of people, but also when you see what happens is that there is a lot of violence and there's a lot of impunity as well uh, when there is a soldier or a policeman involved in um, interpersonal violence and gender-based violence. There's also a lot of uh, one thing that um, happens in Colombia institutionally and is that the military spending is huge uh, compared to spending for education or uh, for the peace accord, like everything that comes with the peace accord that has to be implemented. The military spending is just massive. And um, we receive a lot of um, weapons and a lot of funding from other countries like the United States uh, every year to buy new, uh, buy new weapons, to buy new uniforms, to have the military have the top training. So this is something that has always been present. Like we have a lot of structural problems with our education. We have a lot of problems with other uh, institutions, but we still spend uh, a huge amount of money in the military. Um, does this also happen in Mexico or Cameroon? The question is to, do, to understand how uh, or to what extent the foreigners support the, the military in our local countries? Um, yes, but also how uh, the government spends money, spends a lot of money um, on the military and doesn't spend enough money in other aspects that are important, like education, the healthcare system, like how that is uh, disproportionate, that spending on the military. Yes, I think this is uh, obvious in, in because I don't have the figures now to illustrate this, but when they adopt the annual budget of the country, they used to, to share it between different ministries. And the Ministry of Defense used to have the major part of the, the budget. In the meantime, they will also uh, allocate some funding to ministry in charge of education. When, when you put all together, the budget for defense is the, still the, the, the highest. And since the last past uh, four or five years, they have to explain this, saying that because the country is in trouble, there is conflict in the country, that they need to put more money in the, in, in the military. But this is not uh, really uh, an argument for me because even before we have uh, the war the way we have, they, was not, they were not investing in, in the health, they were not investing in environment, they were not investing in the education sectors. Because the, during the 
the, the national uh, the, the, the celebration of the, the national uh, day there there is always a parade of militaries and on that occasion before the war started we used to see a lot of uh, military artillery military uh, cars and which are very well sophisticated in having the parade even in time of uh, peace i will put it in, in quote they used to use those type of uh, vehicles to show that the like a proof of to 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 those who say when you want to prepare peace you have to prepare the war so it's like like when in time of peace you always used to be get to get ready in case there is a an issue that arises that you should be ready and they were still investing money money for that and the the coronavirus pandemic for example has arisen to demonstrate how our health system is not equipped at all it's not uh, it's not cared yes even the educational system the coronavirus also showed that the educational system is not cared at all because in the classes for example you have to to reduce the number of people to, to to respect the distance and when you try to reduce many people are left out because they will not have where to go so that at the end in the school we still use this the, the, the same system as in the past that you have a lot of students in the same classroom because there are no classrooms so they haven't invested any more and more in in, in building classrooms in the hospital is the same in the hospital you don't have material don't have equipment uh, because what is the priority is war you and you will see that in in the in the defense sector there's almost nothing missing they have all ready to to fight or to do the war they have everything ready in the other sectors, we can miss uh, things, but in the defense sector, no. And of course, Cameroon have military cooperation with uh, with other states like the U.S., like France, like uh, Russia, Israel, some of those states, China. Yes, that the they offer trainings to military. They offer equipment. Uh, they offer uh, even money to to reinforce the the, the the defense sector. Yeah. So um, you say that this is not really an effect of the conflict because it was already happening before. Like they were not spending the money, the uh, the budget on what they needed to be spending it, but it, it was even before the um, the conflict. So would you say that um, the country has been militarized from the start? Like it didn't need to um, go into war to already be militarized, to already be spending a lot of money in the military and having this idea of like, we need to be ready if this happens. Do you think that's something that... Yes. Uh, can describe it? Yes, that's exactly what I was saying. And I was quoting the example of uh, the coronavirus pandemic that came to show how other sectors were neglected since the beginning. Yeah, it's very interesting. We also had a similar, um, a similar experience here with the coronavirus. Uh, while all of this was happening, people were impoverished and they didn't have jobs, they'd lost their jobs. They, uh, so everything was, is uh, very chaotic because of the pandemic, um, but still the government is more concerned with buying um, war aircrafts or buying the police new uniforms. So we see that 
the priorities are very clear and are not, are not on the people, are not in the society. Their priorities are elsewhere. And uh, I, will ask, I will add one more thing, Veronica. Yes, this, that can also explain how or why, explain why the, the defense sector, the military sector has always been more developed, more equipped. This is because uh, the, the, there is no political transition in, in Cameroon since like since many years. The, the president that is governing now is there for about 40 years already, 40 years. And he does everything possible to keep, uh, to, to keep his position at Hebo State. Although there are elections, but there are lots of electoral, there are a lot of frauds that, that makes him uh, maintain this position. And he uses the military to intimidate any political opponent. Yeah. Yeah, so it's true. Uh, so using the military to intimidate other opponents of his government so he can stay in power. Uh, gov governments using the army to maintain the, uh, the power and maintain their positions. Yeah. Yes, this is, this is it's exactly what happened. Uh, some of the examples of this, uh, the last, the last election in 2018. In 2018, and there is one uh, candidate that claimed to have won that opponent. He claimed to have won, and since the the results were published, uh, confirming the victory of the still the, 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 the current president, the opponent who was claiming to have won uh, started some demonstrations in the field. And he tried to do the demonstration in, in due respect of the constitution. That is to request an authorization to inform the authority that is going to demonstrate. And the, the government still consider this uh, demonstration like as illegal and they use then the, the army, the military, the police to, to stop people from demonstrating and even putting into prison some who have, the, uh, who have demonstrated. Yes, or today there are many, uh, many people in prison just because of that. So it's very interesting that you say this because um, we were also thinking about how uh, the military is used for that purpose as well, what you were saying, to stop people from demonstrating, from protesting. Um, right now in Colombia, we, um, we have an ongoing national strike that has gone on for 50 days. And one of the things that we have seen is that, of course, the government uses the military to stop the protesters from demonstrating. Uh, they use a lot of intimidation, but also there's a lot of explicit violence. A lot of people are um, disappeared or um, arbitrarily um, detained or beat up by by the uh by the by the police so but one of the things that that uh i mean that that kind of militarization is very explicit right but there's another kind of militarization that we have seen in this national strike and we wanted to bring it to this session and ask you about it as well and it's the militarization of how of 
the people who are resisting, the people who are protesting. So the people who are protesting the government, they don't agree with this. They don't agree with their neoliberal uh, policies, uh, with the violence. But there's also a very militarized way that the protests are taking form. Um, a lot of aspects of how the protesters organize our military, that kind of discipline, that kind of um, that kind of use of, or um, you know, like use of uh, military structure is very present also in spaces of in movements of resistance. And I think it's very interesting to think that militarization doesn't only happen from the state, doesn't on, only happen from the institution. It also happens from civil society because we have it so normalized and so uh, like so deep in our collective memory that we act that way also in our everyday lives. So what do you what do you think about that? Do you think that also happens um, in Cameroon, in Mexico? I would say that in in Cameroon, the the militarization uh, to mention civil society. No, I don't think it happened like this. But the the civil society is considered by the government as uh, like opponent, like opponent to, to, their, to, to their work. This is overall, a rival way of considering the civil society. But despite of this, uh, this consideration, the civil society organization in Cameroon make all effort to remain uh, responsible, I would say like that, because Despite the, the threats from the government, they, they keep support the, the government in the way they, they, they send proposition to, to govern in the better way. Though this is not always appreciated by the, the government. But the, the, milit the militarized uh, people are some armed groups which are not considered as civil society. There are armed groups who have formed themselves uh, to, to, to ask, or there are, there, were, there were civil society joining some corporations to ask for good governance. But some armed groups use this uh, movement to come in and start using guns to to oppose the, the government. Yes. Thank you, Guy. Mm. Oscar, consideras que en México también eh, se puede ver como una militarización por parte de la sociedad civil, es decir, como en, en movimientos sociales o como espacios de resistencia también adquieren una estructura militar eh, para digamos, actuar desde ahí. Uh, Puedo añadir, Verónica, sí, que hablo también español, eh. también hablo español, sí. No sabía. Ah, sí, sí, quisiera añadir eh, que la sociedad civil en Camerún es muy pacífica, sí, sí, es muy pacífica. Porque a pesar de las amenazas del gobierno, las, todas las veces que salen para demostrar, para manifestar, suelen, no, no, no suelen usar armas, ni armas blancas, nada. Suelen ir a, a manifestar con manos libres. Sí, de modo que cuando la policía viene con su, su artillería, suelen sentarse o ponerse en el suelo simplemente para decir que no estamos dañando a, a nada. Sí. 
esto, esto último que menciona Gray, me parece que abre como la parte a, a lo que queremos que sea el cierre de este ejercicio, y es que vamos a poner aquí en azul aquellos aspectos que dificultan la militarización de la, de la masculinidad y de la sociedad. Como por ejemplo, como ya lo planteó Gay, movimientos sociales que le apuestan por la no violencia. O en Colombia, por ejemplo, el, el crecimiento de eh, las organizaciones feministas, el, el, el importante rol que están adquiriendo en la sociedad las organizaciones feministas. O, eh, no sé, como factores culturales e institucionales que dificultan el, el, el desarrollo, la fuerza que tiene eh, la militarización de las masculinidades. Hablemos de eso para, para ir cerrando este ejercicio. Alejandro, disculpa, es que cuando entiendo, hay, eh, se corta de vez en cuando y que al final no llegó a atender todo el sentido de, de la pregunta. Es que quieres saber si los movimientos sociales que se forman tienen dificultades para uh, luchar contra la militarización o algo así? No, no. Eh, la idea es saber cuáles son los, los elementos, eh, cómo los movimientos sociales, cómo eh, prácticas o aspectos que hacen difícil que se militarice, es decir, ya tenemos algunas prácticas de militarización. Ahora, ¿cuáles son los factores que se oponen a esa militarización? Que hacen difícil que la militarización llegue a todos los jóvenes o que tenga un impacto aún más fuerte. ¿Cuáles son esos factores de resistencia? Ah, sí. Lo, el primer factor de resistencia que yo veo es la, la, la manera de gobernar. ¿sí? La manera de gobernar es que todo está uh, centralizado a uh, mano de unas, unas solas personas que, que lo controlan todo, que lo controlan todo y que los jóvenes o los movimientos que se forman no tienen mucha posibilidad de... De, de, de acceder a, a, a cualquier cosa, porque como todo está controlado con una minoría, sí, hace difícil eh, que los demás puedan eh, tener posibilidad de, de acceder a, a cualquier cosa. Y cabo, eh, cabe mencionar que en esta manera de gobernar, que ya utiliza mucha fuerza, que ya utiliza mu mucha fuerza, es de por sí un obstáculo, porque han logrado hacer que la gente tenga miedo, de modo general. Gai, ¿qué tan fuerte es el movimiento feminista en Camerún? ¿Qué tan fuerte es movimientos de movimientos sociales, movi movimientos de mujeres? Movimientos de mujeres, sí. ¿Qué tanta fuerza tienen en Camerún? Los, hay muchos, hay, hay, hay uh, movimientos de mujeres que lo hacen todo para existir y para hacer que se encienda la voz de mujeres. Sí. Pero esto uh, es difícil porque el gobierno utiliza otras mujeres u otras personas para dividir uh, estos movimientos que, que quieren prosperar. Sí, porque uh, el, gobierno, al gobierno no le gustaría ver un movimiento que estructura muy bien para defender uh, ciertas uh, posturas. Así, cuando una, uh, una idea o un movimiento se está estructurando, siempre habrá uh, gentes en este, en este movimiento o en, un grupo, en este grupo que en un primer momento te dan la impresión de que estaba, estáis trabajando juntos y en cierto momento te das cuenta de que desde el principio han estado en el movimiento o en el grupo 
para tener informaciones, para, para dar informaciones a, a, al gobierno o para servir al gobierno, para decirlo uh, simplemente. Sí, ahí es la mayor dificultad de la, de la estructuración de los movimientos de mujeres. Otra dificultad es que los, la, las mujeres que tienen buenas ideas para uh, expresarse no tienen muchas veces las capacidades de hacerlo. No tienen capacidades por dos razones principales. Uh, la primera es que los hombres que son sus maridos no, uh, no quieren darles la, la, la posibilidad de, uh, de expresarse o de decir lo que tienen que decir. Es, es el primer obstáculo. Uh, el otro obstáculo es la, la pobreza. Sí, la pobreza es un freno a la estructuración de movimientos mujeres porque uh, en las familias de que solo uh, lo que en, en la mayoría de los casos son las mujeres que se encargan, ellas son, eh, no tienen eh, trabajo o tienen que eh, buscar medios para que sus niños, incluso sus maridos puedan comer. Es su lucha eh, diaria, buscar algo para que la familia se alimente. Sí. Y con esta postura ya no ven más lejos, más allá de de hacer que una voz, un argumento suyo se entienda para construir algo que ayude a la comunidad. Sí, ahí son esas una dificultad. He mencionado la pobreza, he mencionado uh, los, los hombres que no le dan la posibilidad, e incluso puedo añadir que otras no tienen uh, capacidades, pienso que lo he mencionado, y la falta de capacidad aquí es que tienen ideas, no, pero no saben, no saben cómo, no cómo expresar estas ideas, cómo transformar eh, esas ideas en acciones concretas de, de, de reivindicación de, de algo concreto. Sí, porque no, tienen, eh, no están formadas para poder defender sus ideas. Eh, también otro, otra de las cosas que creo que podría funcionar para eh, resistir frente a esto es como articular el antimilitarismo con otras luchas sociales, es decir, hablar de feminismo, pero feminismo antimilitarista. Mm, porque teniendo esta postura frente, digamos, en una sociedad tan hipermilitarizada como lo es la colombiana, como es la, la sociedad mexicana o en Camerún, eh, pues tomar esa postura es, es una decisión política, como no voy a, a participar de esta guerra, no voy a participar de esta violencia, sino que voy a construir desde otra orilla, desde otro lugar. Entonces creo que iba muy conectado, digamos, con, con toda la intención del, del proyecto de de masculinidades militarizadas, como pararnos desde el antimilitarismo también, no solo en la academia, sino también en la práctica de nuestras, de nuestras respectivas luchas. Eh, también no sé qué opinan sobre que, digamos, estos espacios como este, como todo el, el simposio de Men Engage, como los espacios de diálogos que abrimos en el proyecto, por ejemplo, también son formas de resistencia, porque desde ahí se, se empieza a construir un conocimiento colectivo, empezamos a aprender más sobre qué son las, los aspectos que, que están, eh, digamos, afectando nuestra vida en, en, de una forma muy, muy personal, pero también muy colectiva. Creo que este compartir experiencias y compartir conocimientos, pues es, es también una forma que se puede, eh, de la que se puede, en la que se puede resistir, porque al final eso es lo que hacemos, ¿no? lo que estamos haciendo en este momento de, bueno, pensémonos otras formas, cómo más podemos eh, habitar una sociedad militarizada. Sí, yo quisiera agregar ahí que 
que este tipo de intercambios fortalecen la, la solidaridad internacional y la solidaridad internacional es un factor clave para hacer frente a la militarización. En Colombia, de hecho, a partir de lo que mencionaba Verónica de la fuerte represión que está viviendo las, las personas que se manifiestan por sus derechos en las calles, pues eh, un factor que hizo que el gobierno eh, redujera un poco sus prácticas de represión y, por ejemplo, evitara comprar unos eh, más aviones de guerra que iban a comprar y, y empezar a hablar de que va a haber reforma a la policía, aunque todavía no lo aplican y lo, si lo aplican va a ser una reforma muy superficial. Pero algo que lleva al gobierno a hacer eso no es solo la presión nacional en las calles, es también la presión internacional. Son todos los países que se han solidarizado con Colombia diciendo detengan la masacre de personas que se manifiestan por sus derechos, no más asesinatos en las calles, ejecutados por la policía, por los militares. El, el mundo entero los está viendo y está diciendo en Colombia hay medidas de dictadura y lo mismo por ejemplo eh, ha ocurrido en México frente al tema de las desapariciones y la presión que se ha ejercido en México por parte de la comunidad internacional en algunos momentos ha llevado a que baje un poco el, el, la fuerza de estas medidas entonces creo que la, la, el intercambio y la solidaridad internacional ofrecen también un importante factor de resistencia frente a lo que es la militarización en los países. Sí, eh, estoy muy, muy de acuerdo con Alejandro, porque lo mismo, lo mismo eh, tiende a ocurrir eh, en Camerún, porque a pesar de la, fuerza, la, 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 la manera fuerte de gobernar, es que a veces eh, los movimientos se dan espacios. Se dan espacios porque el gobierno eh, teme en cierto momento de que desde el, ex, el exterior se piensa que en el interior del país hay eh, esta fuerza que, que reina. Sí, de modo que Uh, los movimientos uh, sociales uh, muestran, tienen, muestran en, quieren mostrar lo que se pasa en el país, quieren mostrarlo al exterior para que desde el exterior se sepa cómo funciona el, el país. Y considerando eso, el gobierno en cierto momento no está... Uh, no, no ejerce tanta presión, no uh, ejerce tanta presión en estos movimientos. Sí, y el, el hecho de que, de que los dirigentes se, encuentra, se encuentren fuera del país, por ejemplo, durante las reuniones internacionales, los dirigentes del país cuando se encuentran en reuniones internacionales suelen tomar la palabra, pero muchas las veces dicen mentiras, dicen mentiras, dicen uh, cosas otras de las que la gente experimenta eh, en el país. Y esto para mí es un, una señal de que tienen conciencia de que su manera de hacer no, no, no está buena. Y esta conciencia, los movimientos sociales la utilizan para encontrarse un espacio. Sí, así que le, las conversaciones que tenemos aquí, eh, otros, o, otras ocasiones que existen para poder intercambiar sobre nuestras situaciones respectivas, son importantes porque nos dan la posibilidad de saber cómo se hace en otros países y nos dan... Nos dan uh, astucias o, o nos dan uh, ideas para poder uh, tener, crear, crear, uh, 
crea espacios en, crea espacios en, nuestros, en nuestro país para defender nuestras ideas también. Sí, así que cuando el gobierno tiene conciencia de que hay ojos exteriores que están mirando, sí que en algún momento sí, tratan de, de considerar que hay gente que tienen derechos que hace falta respetar también. Eh, muchas gracias por compartirnos eso, Guy. La verdad es que sí, es... es gracias, eh, Verónica. Muchas gracias, y también a Oscar Santiago. Eh, bueno, ya estamos como sobre la hora para terminar nuestra sesión. Eh, y antes de terminar, Jennifer va a mostrarles como unas, una invitación para el cierre de, del simposio como tal. Eh, pero pues quería agradecerles a, a todos por estar acá, por compartirnos sus experiencias eh, desde, digamos, sus perspectivas. De verdad que fue muy enriquecedor poder tener eh, este espacio, ojalá que se pueda repetir. Y, y pues les vamos a, eh, a compartir lo que salga de esto, que es, digamos, la idea que tenemos de hacer una infografía para poder organizar toda esta información y decir como, bueno, hay, eh, um, hay patrones comunes entre nuestras experiencias contextuales. Entonces, cuando tengamos eso, pues se los haremos llegar. Eh, um, muchas gracias por su participación, por su tiempo, por sus aportes tan valiosos. Y, um, y pues nada, vamos a... Eh, bueno, no sé si Alejo quieras decir algo antes de cerrar para que Jennifer pueda mostrar eh, la invitación. No, agradecer mucho eh, el espacio, eh, los aportes. Eh, creo que pues, hay distintas formas de construir infografías, pero este ejercicio de tratar de hacer una construcción colectiva ha sido bien bonito y creo que podríamos eh, repetir luego eh, este espacio tratando de, no sé, cómo ubicar más, más datos, más aspectos que nos lleven un poco a profundizar en lo que estamos haciendo para resistir a la militarización. Pero muchas gracias, fue un, un ejercicio bien interesante, como que aprendo mucho de los aportes que, que hicieron eh, a la actividad. Eh, Jennifer nos va a compartir pantalla para mostrarnos eh, las últimas diapositivas sobre el simposio Men Engage. Y muchísimas gracias Verónica y Alejandro. Y Guy por compartir esta sesión con nosotros y nada más para darles eh, un gran momento de apreciación por participar eh, en el simposio y muchísimas gracias por estar presente en la sesión y de nuevo a Verónica y Alejandro eh, con mucha apreciación eh, por vuestro tiempo y participación en este proceso. Thank you so much, muchas gracias.